Hey, garden nerds, we have a sponsor for this episode. True Leaf Market has been a supplier of exclusively non-GMO seeds since 1974. They offer a wide selection of seeds, many of which are heirloom and organic, for everything from vegetables to flowers, grains to herbs, and specialty seeds. I'd say where they shine is in their huge selection of seeds and growing supplies for sprouting and microgreens. So if you're into that, check them out. Their seed packets are affordable and they are available in sizes for the home gardener all the way up to bulk wholesale. Visit trueleafmarket.com and use our promo code GTOTW10. That's GTOTW, like gardener tip of the week, and the number 10. Now, on with the show. Welcome, everyone, to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where garden nerds from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. This week, we're chatting with Lisa Kiverist, author of six books, advocate, and co-owner of In Serendipity Farm. That's I-N-N, In Serendipity. Lisa is a senior fellow endowed chair in agricultural systems in the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture at the University of Minnesota and a Kellogg Food and Community Fellow. Lisa's work focuses on championing rural leadership opportunities among female farmers and food-based entrepreneurs. And that just scrapes the surface of her resume, I swear. I am so excited to chat with you, Lisa. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you so much, Christy. So we met years ago, and I think it was at Harbin Hot Springs. It was a one-night-only writer's gathering. You were working on your book, Farmstead Chef, and I was working on my novel, Garden Variety. And I've followed your work through the years, and I'm really excited to talk to you because in all this time, we've only emailed. We've never really spoken in person in all of these, these years. So let's start with In Serendipity. What is it and where is it? Tell us all about it. Sure. And I'm so glad you reminded me of that night we first crossed paths because we were such kindred spirits on so multiple levels uh, and continue to this day to keep planting literal seeds, idea seeds, writing, all of that. So again, thank you for the invitation to join you and your community today. So yes, I am on our farm in Southern Wisconsin in Serendipity. We have been here nearly on 30 years. And um, the short story is we, my husband, John Ivanko and I got here when we had just turned 30. Uh, so you can do a little bit of math. We've been here a while, but we came without ever having planted a seed, which I don't exactly recommend uh, oh, wow. in the literal sense because <laughs> we uh, were suburban city kids. He grew up outside of Detroit. I grew up in Chicago and we met at our first job outside Chicago and we're doing things my mom still considered normal, you know, working in cubicles for paychecks, but we were drawn to the rural area, you know, first just getting out of the city, camping, hiking, that kind of thing. And, and it evolved to starting to think these thoughts of, Hey, could we live here, you know, and go back to the city when we needed to, and could we learn how to grow things? And despite the fact that we did not germinate zucchini our first year, uh, <laughs> the short story is if we can learn to, run a diversified organic produce farm, truly anybody can. So yeah, we, we're small, we're just on five acres. We are on a, what's called a century farm here in the Midwest. So it had been owned by the former owners for over a hundred years and we are the, the new generation. Um, so it has a lot of character. It has a lot of old buildings, barn buildings, outbuildings, a, a old farmhouse that we are you know always constantly repairing and tweaking. But John and I love that character. We are really into restoring things from a sustainability perspective. So uh, using green design, using renewable energy elements, using content with recycled materials, et cetera. We've over the years been slowly renovating and restoring the farmstead back to its vibrancy, but with a new um, green sheen, if you will. So for example, we do run the farm completely on renewable energy. We're, right now we're running on solar. Uh, we were on wind for a while too, but things change, prices change of equipment. So it's, it's always an evolving journey, but we are um, completely powered by the sun. And that's been part of our story too. So uh, yeah, very dependent on mother nature on multiple counts, especially in the growing field. So we do diversified vegetables, um, primarily for our local community here. And uh, we have also over the years run a bed and breakfast and have used produce in, in the breakfasts on people's plates as well. And uh, yeah, 
that we're getting excited to get transplants going and get hands back in the soil this season. Nice. And when is your last frost? When do you plant usually? Well, that's a good question. And that's been <laughs> changing. You know, I mean, it's truly interesting because in those 25 plus years we've been here, it is uh, so relevant of climate change and how things have changed. And our growing season has extended on both sides, which on one level, I have no problem having greens and things earlier and later, but it is so evident. So yeah, so um, you know, generally beginning of May, but it uh, it it does really depend. We've had late snows, late frosts, a lot of uh, covering the thing desperately at the last moment, you know, but in general, we have tried to plant things later and not stress about it. It's just simpler. And part of our situation with the farm and selling locally, we, we don't have things on contract or very specific requirements, which has helped us, you know, in the sense of we, we, what we have in abundance, we can sell. And if something doesn't work out or there is that late frost, we're okay. And do you have any animals on the property? That we have had historically over the years, chickens, but no, no, we focus on those plants. And we also, uh, yeah. I must say, like to travel and being, that's how we met, when we met you, you know, in Harvard Hot Springs. So being footloose farmers, animals put things in a different category of responsibilities. So uh, yeah. stick with plants. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I'm I'm good with chickens because I know I can train anybody to take care of them. But when it's once you get into the bigger animals, uh, I think that's a little too much to deal with. But that doesn't stop me exactly. from wanting a wanting a mini cow someday. <laughs> oh yeah, well they're really cute. <laughs> that's a different category. <laughs> yeah. So you founded an event and then wrote a book about it called Soil Sisters. Who are Soil Sisters and what do they do? Yeah. So here in my southern Wisconsin farmhood, but this is reflected throughout the country, is women make up one of the fastest growing groups of new farmers, particularly in the small scale, local food focused, sustainable organic ag realm. And pretty soon after we had moved here, I was feeling isolated in the sense of I love the rural setting. I love not having neighbors. I can see all of that. But when it comes to building community and getting to know your people in your area, it's not particularly helpful. So we started gathering women in our area who shared those values of sustainability and of healthy soil and all of that, be it farmers um, professionally, but enthusiastic gardeners and homesteaders and shoppers, right? We need people who, who want to buy supporting these products. So we started meeting and it just grew. So that's what has become our Soil Sisters group. We are here in Southern Wisconsin, a network of over 250 women. And we are now a project of the nonprofit Renewing the Countryside. So uh, working even on starting some new networks throughout the country and being able to create situations where women can connect. That's even the research proves, Christy, that's how we learn, right? We learn what we gather and we learn through sharing and not necessarily through just a PowerPoint lecture at the end of the room, right? So these potlucks we've been doing are so much more than just a meal or a party, it's information's exchanged, right? And women get to know each other and new ideas bloom. There's been so many new businesses that have started because we've met over those years. And so then we started doing some more public events under the Soil Sisters name. And then the book I did, Soil Sisters, a toolkit for women farmers, stemmed from this work in the women farmer space in that there's just not a lot of resources. And again, with women learning best from each other, that isn't curated in traditional educational cycles. So yeah, it's inspired a lot of this type of work to really bottom line encourage more women to start farming. It's interesting when you look at the US ag census numbers, yes, women are growing in number, but it's also being driven by women in their 40s, women midlife who are starting farms. Maybe they're returning to family land that they grew up on and perhaps swore they would never go back into farming, but you know, things change. And or they're following a dream they've always had and said, hey, you know, now is the time. But what's interesting is women who are in that category often come into farming as a business with a whole slew of other skill sets, right? They might have been in corporate, marketing, finance, whatever, teaching. It could have been a million things. So it's really an exciting time. And a lot of good things are are literally blooming. And Soil Sisters, is it, do you have, you said you have over 250 members is that just locally or are you spanning nationwide yeah. now? 
No, no, that's, that's locally. And I appreciate you mentioning that because that's kind of our point is wherever someone is, there's community there, you know, in that it just takes time. It took us close to 20 years to find each other and, and nurture that and invite women along and to build that network. But it's doable wherever you are. It's not, it's definitely not some magic formula. It's just getting together regularly and having that space, that safe space amongst us to dream and we all share that passion for gardening and for planting things literally and figuratively, but then things start sparking where, yeah, there's been women who came to Soul Sisters as enthusiastic home gardeners and homesteaders that are now selling at the market, you know, or that are now doing a CSA or other things. And it's really inspiring when you see women connecting over our fondness for plants, because <laughs> it, it's one of those situations where literally when the, when the water rises, all the ships rise, you know, in the sense of we share with each other, we support each other's business. We don't see it as competition yeah. or anything like that. And and that is not how business 101 is typically done. And that's kind of the point, right? We need to do things differently and more collaboratively. So exciting things happening. Yeah. And I mean, you know, let women run the world. We do it better. So hey, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and we would eat better. Yes, indeed. indeed. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I used, you mentioned... Uh, about selling selling items from their homes. Uh, I think the thing I heard about most over the years was your advocacy regarding the cottage food industry and the, the licensing and legality around that. This is for people who want to be able to sell food made at home, like savory or sweet baked good items or canned jams or other prepared foods from the garden and from the kitchen. It was an uphill battle, wasn't it? Well, it's interesting. Yes, definitely here in Wisconsin, cottage food laws are state specific. So the good news is, as of last year, when New Jersey finally passed their law, wherever you are in the country, you can produce specific items. Like you were saying, it's primarily what's technically called non-hazardous items. So the safer items that don't need refrigeration is a quick way to summarize it. But like the cookies, the the baked goods, the high acid canned items like jams and salsas, uh, but a variety of things, dried items. Um, and yeah, and that basically gives people the opportunity to become a food entrepreneur overnight in their home kitchen because you don't have the cost of a commercial kitchen. You don't have a lot of the just regulatory barriers. And it really goes back to how we had our community structured, right? Not that long ago where it was common to buy a loaf of bread from your neighbor, right? It's more than mm -hmm. just an economic transaction. It's community building. So the great news is, is really in the last 10 years and particularly amplified during the COVID pandemic is these businesses have just gone gangbusters in the sense of the laws are expanding. You can earn more, you can sell more out of your home kitchen and people are more aware of this. So indeed I've been active here in Wisconsin because uh, at times, well, not at times, but unfortunately, increasingly, we hit barriers where our elected officials aren't supporting what is needed. And Wisconsin had a terrible cottage food law. We couldn't get a bill passed for baked goods, just et cetera. But fortunately, we have uh, still <laughs> three branches of democracy. And when the legislative fails you, we <laughs> went over to judicial. And a group of other fellow women farmers that I have now sued the state successfully twice on the rights of cottage food entrepreneurs. So we had a first lawsuit on behalf of baked goods and a second one on behalf of other items that are perfectly safe to sell, but don't need to go in the oven like candy or roasted coffee or dried herbs, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. Wisconsin is highly unusual um, in that most other states, just their legislatures get behind this. You know, it's a good thing, right? It stimulates new business. It brings economic force into the state. So, so yeah, wherever you are, there's opportunity and check with your own state, state regulations because they do vary, but it is much more feasible now. So yes, as you were saying, I've been on a mission to <laughs> share this information. That's what our, John and my book Homemade for Sale that recently came out with a second edition, which is like a hundred pages longer and updated because so much has happened since the book first came out in 2015. So if you ever have a dream of starting a food business, now's the time because again, you don't have all of that cost, commitment, rent, all of those things that can often drive a new business under, you can get started. And in many cases, people start their cottage food business, Christy, and then they become 
a bricks and mortar bakery. But but every kind of food entrepreneur I've talked to who's gone that commercial route says hands down the reason for their success is that opportunity to work out of their home kitchen and literally have training wheels for a while. Yeah. And speaking of your book, Homemade for Sale, it gives people a step-by-step guide to starting their own food-based business from home. And I assume this came out of your own efforts to do so at selling at the Inn Serendipity. What do you usually make that you sell? Yeah, no, exactly. The book stemmed out from our needs and experience and just the fact that in talking to people, so many people had no idea what I was talking about. I mean, you can do that? That's legal? I didn't know that. No, you can't do that. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Plus, for the majority of cottage food entrepreneurs, nearly 90% are women. Um, mm-hmm. in, you know, stay-at-home moms or people starting side businesses. The majority of cottage food entrepreneurs, this is their first time starting a business, which is really a big, important leap in that it's one thing, most people have been making these things for forever, right? You've been making these cookies at the holidays and giving them away, but now you're charging for them. Mm-hmm. And that, I would argue, is again, as we've been saying, more than an economic transaction. It's empowering. It's confidence building. But it also needs skill sets in how do you start your business? You know, How do you incorporate if you want to do that? How do you track your finances, et cetera, et cetera? So yes, that's what the Homemade for Sale book does. And as we've been rolling in the cottage food scene, have been doing that ourselves, primarily with baked goods. I sell, um, and this is what's cool about these businesses, is they can really reflect your your story, your family, your history. So on the bake side, I do a lot of uh, Baltic baked goods, where my family's from. My dad's Estonian, my mom's Latvian. So rye bread is a big thing there. So I do Latvian rye breads and some cookies. And then we showcase the things we're growing. So the high acid canned items, we do pickles and sauerkraut. I make an Estonian pickled pumpkin, which is a little unusual, but that's sort of the point is some of these cottage food businesses, I'd argue most of them, they um, they can showcase products that even can't be made commercially and in the store, right? You just, there wouldn't be a market, it's unique, but they also can't be produced at that level. So really special things if, uh, uh, to seek out, you know, be at your farmer's market or your community, there's undoubtedly people right now selling through their home kitchen. And as someone who just recently in the last couple of years got a pressure canner, I wanted to ask, is it, is it legal to sell things from your pressure canner or does it have to be all water bath canning things? That's a great question, Christy. It depends on your state. Um, Ah. In general, yes, water bath canning, but I believe there are states that are allowing pressure canners now that they've, well, A, they're a whole lot safer than they used to be, right? You know, they're just coming of a new era. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So that's where, and again, most states have it very well outlined. Typically, it is through the Department of Agriculture in your state that regulates the cottage food industry. So they often have really good um, information on their website or webinars or all that sort of stuff to get you into the nitty gritty and people to ask those kind of questions. too. Nice. And obviously, you've worked out the kinks of doing this kind of business along the way, what mistakes did you make early on that you care to share with the audience? Oh, (laughs) yeah. Well, you know, my one big learning and big piece of advice is don't make things for sale that you don't like to eat yourself. It sounds (laughs) obvious. I mean, it's the same thing I always say with like growing in your garden, you know, Mm -hmm. don't grow something but you don't like to ultimately eat because ultimately you'd be the one eating it unless you are farming as a business or have a contract for something fine. But uh, yeah, because ultimately if you do have something left over, you go to the market with that rye bread and it doesn't sell, I bring it home. But even more so, that's what you're passionate about, right? And if it's Mm -hmm. something that you love to eat, that it's a recipe you've been using for forever and there's a family story behind it or or you grew some of the produce that goes into it yourself, all of that together uh, shows when you're talking about it, right? When you're marketing it. So definitely don't try to cookie cutter, no bad pun intended, into what other people are doing. Because right now, in a good way, there's so many new cottage food entrepreneurs, but it can easily be intimidating. And you can look online and see what everybody's doing. And there are sure a lot of people who do decorated cookies and they're beautiful, but that's not necessarily what we need more of. We need something that I just saw a local baker by me who's getting started and she's also a huge gardener and she's making gorgeous shortbread cookies 
with dried flowers on the top. You know, oh, their names nice. are truly works of art. You know, so but but there's a story there, and it reflects her passion. So yeah, follow that. It is for all of us, I think, in different ways. The pandemic has caused us to reevaluate our lives, right, and our livelihoods. And for a lot of folks, it they didn't want to go back to same old, same old. And especially for people who you add put, put all those things together. And you add in the fact that there are a number of people, particularly women, who uh, are just, um, they've had this dream, right, of starting a food business. And it only takes a pandemic to be that lightning bolt to say, let's do it now. So, yeah, yeah. And, and what's nice is, as all of this has been rolling, the parallel movement has been this continual increase of customers looking for these types of products, right, wanting to support their local community wanting transparency in their product in that I don't know exactly what goes into my pickles, right? There they are in the field growing and the cucumbers and, and, and. Um, so that's a really nice merging of uh, opportunity for everybody. So it's just, it's just the right time to think about that. Starting yeah. your own cottage food home-based business. Well, it is tip time. Do you have a favorite tip you'd like to share with the Garden Art audience? And I know you've already shared so much, but what else? What else do you want to share? Oh, you bet. Well, well, let's continue that cottage food theme because if you, well, obviously, if you're listening to this podcast and a fan of your work, Christy, you're an enthusiastic gardener and you love that aspect. Is I think too often when somebody really loves gardening, the immediate thought is, or the immediate piece of advice you get is, you should be a farmer and. That might work for some folks. I mean, it's, it's part of our livelihood mix for sure, but not necessarily. And think about a cottage food business that showcases what you're growing. Anything from, you know, jams and jellies and things that showcase the fruits or those seasonal items that go in jars to the baked goods and utilizing some of that in your baked goods um, is a way to uh, have a business. And, and John, I've done a lot of writing in that realm over time, our book Ecopreneuring goes into the business startup side, because we're all about the blending of these livelihoods and creating livelihoods under sustainable sustainability, period, sustainable agriculture, that allow you to do what reflects your values. So in this case, uh, specifically, if you are a hobby gardener, now you're a gardening business, and everything you're talking about, your seeds, your other items for the gardening uh, classes, et cetera, are, are all, all a deductible expense. And I realize that's a big idea I'm throwing out there, but it is an important one. And it allows you to really do what you want to do smartly from a financial side when you have your own business running. So for folks who are intrigued by that, we have an opportunity coming up uh, April 10th through 13th in 2023 is our second home-based food entrepreneur virtual national conference. So this is with Renewing the Countryside, also the, the nonprofit I mentioned that is the host for Soil Sisters is also hosting this conference. And it's going to be a fantastic, easy on-ramp. If you are curious at all about cottage food and starting a business, we're going to have some of the top speakers in the country talking about this and a range of cottage food entrepreneurs who are sharing their story. And like we were talking about early, earlier, Christy, in the women's communities of sharing what our successes are and what our failures are. So it's a real slice of authenticity and an opportunity to ask questions. There's a lively community in the online conference platform. So all of this uh, for just $35 and everything is recorded. So we hope to see people there and um, all the information on our book site, homemadeforsale.com. You can find all of this and I'll get you the exact uh, conference link for your show notes there too, Christy. So that's Perfect. an opportunity. The whole thing will be live for three months after the conference. And if one of these quirky benefits of our virtual world now, as we evolve under under the pandemic still is this opportunity to do things like this, you know, and to be able to connect with what will probably be over a thousand cottage food entrepreneurs throughout the country. You will find your kindred spirit. So I look forward <laughs> to, to seeing folks there. Amazing. Yeah. It got a lot easier to be online and do virtual conferencing because Zoom happened and everything else that came out about that. It's It's been great. And you beat me to it. I, my next question after thanking you, of course, for being on this podcast, and I'm just so thrilled that we finally got to have this conversation, is, is to ask you where people can find you. So you've given us the info about the conference. Now, what about you and in serendipity? 
Yeah, so the bulk of what we've been talking about today is off of our homemadeforsale.com site, off the Homemade for Sale book. And you can find me there and um, look forward to folks thinking about selling some of that stuff that's in the beautiful garden beds. Okay, great. And do you have any social media platforms that you are on or no? Uh, you, can, you can find me on Facebook under okay. Lisa Kivers. Yep, terrific. Okay, all right. Garden nerds, that's it for this week. You'll find a link to Lisa's website and her uh, links to social media and where to find her books all at gardennerd.com this week. Thanks for joining us. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at gardennerd.com. Show your support for this podcast and the other free stuff on Garden Nerd by becoming a Patreon subscriber. And don't forget to visit our sponsor, trueleafmarket.com. You'll find us on Instagram and Twitter under Garden Nerd One, on Facebook as gardennerd.com, and of course, our Garden Nerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!